Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our virtual session of the En-ROADS Climate Workshop. We are so thrilled that you're all here. My name is Caroline Reed. I work with Climate Interactive, and I'm going to help host this webinar today. So I just want to call attention to two little resources um, on your GoToWebinar control panel before we get started. So on the right, you're going to see a tab called Questions. And we'd love for you to use this feature to ask us questions throughout uh, the extent of the webinar. You can ask us questions about the model, the game, anything you're curious about, and we'll try to get answers to you throughout the webinar. As well, you can use this feature later in the webinar to interact with us. We'll be asking some questions uh, throughout the session that you'll be able to type your answer into the text box there. Uh, in addition, I'd love for you to open the chat box, which is just below the questions, and you'll be able to see that we've already sent you one resource which will be useful during this workshop. So if you go to the chat box, you'll see we sent the one-page guide to the Inroads control panel, and later on in the session, we'll be sending some other helpful links. So keep questions and chat in your mind. Feel free to interact with us. We're all doing this together, and we're so excited you're here. Um, so I'm now going to pass this over to Drew Jones, who will be leading the workshop. And yeah, thanks. All right, thank you, Caroline. Uh, this is Andrew Jones with Climate Interactive, and I want to welcome you and just acknowledge uh, your courage and dedication to step up and think about really the long term of uh, global society at a time when so many of us, and I know many of you, are dealing with short-term challenges wherever you are in the world. So just acknowledging your courage for, for being here. Um, we're going to present today the En-ROADS Climate Workshop. And uh, in one sense, what we have is a tool for you to really think with your colleagues about how we can address climate in this next period of time, post COVID-19, when we rebuild our lives and our economy, can we do that in a way that prevents the next global existential threat, that, present, that helps avoid those next crises that we know would come in the future if we don't do a lot to avoid climate change? So this is a simulation en roads address. Uh, built by Climate Interactive and MIT Sloan Sustainability Initiative, along with Ventana Systems. This is where you can find us on Twitter, share what you're thinking about this. Um, if you have really detailed questions about the model, send them to uh, support at climateinteractive.org. Go to the website. Of course, all the materials are there. So in one sense, how to engage people to think about this. Also, there are educators or community leaders who are organizing online sessions like one we're doing right now, you can do that yourself. So there's a tool, this is a tool for those that kind of engagement. But I really want to just start by getting you thinking about this question I asked a minute ago. What seems possible post COVID-19? This is going to come, this is going to go, it may remain in different ways, but post this crisis, what seems possible for addressing the climate crisis that did not seem possible three months ago. This crisis is closing many doors, but it's also opening some possibilities. So what seems possible that you would like that's on your mind? And we'd really love to see, just as a check-in question before we play with the simulator, we're gonna be needing answers to this question as we run different scenarios in a minute. But um, if you would, in the questions box, and you'll see it right there, um, what seems possible? So please answer this question and write it in the uh, questions box. We are able to see the answers and you're, I think, able to see the questions that are being asked, asked as well. What do I see? Uh, Sean said dramatic emissions reduction. Kurt, society is capable of dramatic rapid change. Worldwide collaboration, says Kim, bipartisanship in the United States seems more possible says Molly Sullivan. Uh, the crisis shows what sectors really matter. Keep our societies going. Benjamin, less consumption, less flights. Jeff says nuclear being increased, carbon sequestration, collective thinking, non-market driven society. Anupam, hey Anupam. Uh, investments in green infrastructure as part of the economic stimulus. Change in human behavior, more cycling, more working from home, um, endangered animal habitat, more open to carbon fee and dividend, 
carbon pricing and cleansing water, fast and coordinated world. Wow, this is amazing. I didn't know you'd be so fast with this. Partnerships seem possible. Um, trying to find the link between this challenge and the climate crisis, says Miriam. Think for Earth immunity. Shared misery creates unity. Important opportunity to singular objectives. Nuclear carbon pricing, inequalities. Okay, there are many possibilities. So, thank you for this. Wow, you guys are really fast. You found the question box, this is great. Okay, so given that, if there are these possibilities, we're here to think about what it could look like uh, and what the implications could be for the climate if we were to take advantage of many of these opportunities. And we're gonna do it in our simulator called En-ROADS. So here is the En-ROADS interface. I believe some of you have seen it, many of you have not. But the basic idea, it's a simulator that will test some of these possibilities. Uh, some people were writing, writing below uh, different scenarios for economic growth. So it's this is just to show you as a demonstration of how the model works. Uh, there are many graphs that are possible up here. Here's gross world product over on the right. Uh, this is the main driver, you could say, of emissions. More and more uh, goods and services and consumption. Over on the right, this is the pollution, greenhouse gas net emissions. Here's the overall temperature. This is a business as usual future. This is not our prediction. This is a plausible starting point from which to do experiments. Someone in the box just wrote below, um, perhaps slower economic growth. Certainly in 2020, we're seeing that. But if it's sustained, someone asks, well, what would continue? Uh, and the, the point of the model is to ask questions like that. So I'm gonna go down here to the dots and say, uh, well, economic growth, GDP per person, two and a half percent a year. How much of a difference would it make if the slower growth that we're seeing this year is sustained? So we can imagine, well, what if it is two point, well, actually, let me do it in another way. Think in your head, how much would temperature go down if this two and a half percent a year dropped to two or down to 1.7, sustained throughout the century? What if it was sustained? So think in your head, what might it do? The purpose of the model then is to do the math for us, to supplement what we call our mental models. But I'd slow it down, imagine what you think greenhouse gas emissions will do, temperature will do if we have slower growth around the world. So here we are at 2.3, 2.2, 2.1, 1.9, 1.7, 1.8, 1.9, 1.8, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9,
into policy, into action, as collective action globally, as personal, state, community level action, when we think about what could be retained from our learnings at this time and implemented throughout the world, what kind of effect might it have in the world on temperature? So I'm gonna go and show you, here's a diagram and our team. Oh, and by the way, there are three people, you just saw Caroline, but Cassandra is also on the line and Bindu Bandari is in Kathmandu, Nepal. And the three of them will be answering your questions, but also if one of you would send in chat the link to this diagram that you all see right here. This is the guide to the control panel. This is the area you can see, which are all the sliders at the bottom, and then a short description of what we can test, what you can test with the model. So think, what are the learnings we have now? What might get implemented in the future? Therefore, what should we test into the future as actions that we could take? Someone said, oh, we have much more working from home. We have much more use of biking and other kind of transportation. That would show up here, transport energy efficiency. It says increase or decrease the energy efficiency of vehicles, shipping, air travel, and transportation systems. Transportation systems, that's biking and walking and things like that. So you could say, I would like to see what would be possible in that area. But there are also another 17 possibilities. So look at all of these possibilities and think, what might we implement post COVID-19? And let's think about what impact it might have on um, addressing the climate. So I'm gonna go back over here to our main setup and I'm gonna take a look and uh, see what, what we're getting. So these are gonna be the things that I'm gonna read we're gonna, I'm reading out uh, what those possibilities are. Uh, so please write in the chat box um, what, cut yeah. bioenergy, allow more forests and grasslands to grow. Um, do we have hydrogen in the, well, that's a question. So propose, yeah, because, go sorry, ahead. Drew, I was just gonna make sure people, if you can write that into your questions box, we will start to read your proposal. So this is a, a great chance to review that one page control panel write it to us in the questions and then we'll start to implement your suggestion. Thanks. Great, so I'm reading, no more fossil fuel infrastructure, um, says Kurt Newton. So I'm gonna read off many of these that maybe after this, one of the investments we make is no more fossil fuel. So this is a time, and if you can, make your suggestion in the terms of the, the sliders that you see on the interface afforestation, deforestation, methane and other, less coal, carbon price, transportation, energy efficiency. What are the actions that you see post COVID-19 that you would be curious about? What would happen in the long term on the climate if we implemented those policies? Write them, if you would, into the question box. We'll read them and we can test many of them. So increase use of wind and solar, says Raymond Hinchcliffe. Um, I'm going to read off many before I test any. Make fossil fuel prices higher. Wind and solar, no more fossil fuel. So keep writing. Um, telecommuting. Wow, telecommuting is certainly happening. Planting more trees, afforestation, one tree for every human. More electric vehicles. Technological carbon removal, deurbanization. Carbon price of $50 a ton more virtual meetings, access to charging stations, working from home. Boy, people are really talking about that a good bit. Carbon pricing, CO2 taxing, um, electrification of transport, new technology. All right, these are great. And I might call back on our team to read some more out, but let's start testing some of them. Um, I'm gonna reset here. And here we are at 4.1 degrees. This is the business as usual future. So the people, I heard three or four on this idea of telecommuting. And basically we could think of that as improving the efficiency of transport systems. And they're already improving. That is improving as in it takes less and less energy to deliver transportation services. Here we see, and by the way, you can go and read um, what is the assumption, the projected change, the amount of energy used by transport. Here's a description. And underneath, of course, as you play with the model, you can hit this little I button and you can read more details about it. 
key dynamics, co-benefits, equity considerations. These, by the way, were written by Cassandra here on the phone. Slider settings, model structure. So these are all the information you can get. We're already improving half a percent a year. Here's the how much energy it takes to deliver a trillion dollars of value. What if GoToWebinar and Zoom takes off and we don't need to drive as much? So to, in order to uh, do our work, think for a second, what do you think it's going to do? Which of the lines over here on the left is gonna move? So think of which color line. Is it gas in blue? Is it coal in brown? Is it uh, the red of oil, wind and solar? So run your metal model first. Let me make this full. And then we're gonna test it. So here we are, we're gonna have an improvement. I'm gonna crank it up. So think about what it's gonna do. And then I'm gonna crank it up. And here we're moved it up to 2.6% a year. I'm going to replay that last change. Which do you see moving? Well, the biggest one is moving, of course, is the red line. We don't have to burn as much oil in order to deliver these services. I'm hitting replay a few more times. That's the one that moves the most. But also, there are transportation systems driven with electricity. Therefore, coal goes down as well. But the biggest impact is here on transport energy efficiency is on oil, greenhouse gas net emissions, we don't burn as much oil and coal. So particularly in the latter half of the century, you can see there's less emissions and temperature goes from 4.1 down to 3.9. Did it save the climate? No, of course not. Did it help? Absolutely. You can't plant a garden with one seed. You can't plant the garden with one seed of just doing this one thing. It's going to take multiple seeds, as we see, in order to get the garden that gets us to well below two degrees or 1.5. So that definitely helped. So there's one, one action that we took. Some others that people were talking about was really about addressing, uh, well, other things that were mentioned like fossil fuels and electrification. And I'm going to try electrification. I'm actually going to undo this transportation change. And let's just go to electrification for a second. Imagine a world where we have massive growth in electrification. So think about that for a second. What is that gonna do? Which of those lines do you expect to move if we were to boost the investment in electrification in transport? We're gonna crank it up in the same way. So think, which line, how much do you think it's gonna move it? Just did it, and we're gonna redo this one. In the same way, uh, you saw the red line go down again in this way, but, <laughs> Notice different behavior. What is the brown line of coal doing this time? It's going up. Why is it going up? Well, we're not, we're electrifying. So what we need is a lot of new electricity around the world. And this is China, India, Mexico, Indonesia, Brazil. That's how the investments are happening. Where does the world get new electricity today? Absent significant costs for uh, coal, oil, and gas, excuse me, for gas and coal. Well, it gets it largely from new coal, and there are abundant supplies out there. So it helps, but only a little bit. 4.1 goes down to 3.9, excuse me, 4.1 goes down to 4.0. And as the brown line of coal goes up, we actually get more wind and solar as well, which is helpful. We get a little more natural gas, but it helps just a little bit. Now I'm going to put these two together. We have more efficient transport. We have electrified transport but we haven't put pressure on fossil fuels. Many of the things I just saw you write into, into uh, the question box were about pressure on those fossil fuels. So uh, I saw one of you say, what if we have no new uh, infrastructure for coal? Now this is a radically different future. We can start seeing what some of these possibilities are, but certainly the health considerations we're having right now may lead us to say, there are so many deaths from coal, from air pollution, respiratory problems. In our work on multi-solving, we've been quantifying the huge costs of not just the climate cost of coal, but also the health costs of coal, the personal um, productivity costs of coal. What if we were able to stop building new coal infrastructure? Now, mind you, this is a huge change. Imagine what it would do if that brown line were to stop growing around 2025, and then all the coal plants would fade away. So again, in your head, think, what would the impact be? I'm gonna turn it on, watch what the impact would be as we watch that brown line. 
peaks in 2025, 20, 2025, and then fades away. Now there's some compensating feedback. The system doesn't just cancel coal and then keep everything else the same. What do you see moving the most? Yeah, the blue line, blue line of natural gas. So instead of coal, we get huge investment in natural gas, which of now is the fastest growing energy supply on earth. Here in the United States, we're the largest exporter of natural gas. So it's what we call the squeeze the balloon problem. We squeeze down on coal, and then we get a huge growth in natural gas. Um, small shift in oil as well, but look what the impact is over on the right. Emissions go down, natural gas net emissions, 3.9 down to 3.4. And that makes a huge difference, half a degree. So we've made some real progress. Now we've done three things. So far, we have pushed down on coal, no new infrastructure, energy efficiency transport, and we have electrified and we're at 3.4. Oh, by the way, now that you don't have coal, that electrification helps a good bit more. Now I'm gonna pause for a second and just to ask Caroline, are there any questions or things that have come up that, I don't know, I just skipped over and seem pretty essential that everyone needs to know before we proceed um, any more right now? Um, of course, you're answering many of the questions on your own. Yeah, of course. Um, one question, when you had just applied the energy efficiency of transport alone, was about the time delay and why specifically we're seeing it start after 2045. And if yeah, you what a good question. Yeah. So uh, what I'm gonna do is, um, I'm gonna go back to the other version of this and, and, and just run that one on its own. So here we were, remember we saw the emissions and someone asked about why it takes so long for there to be such an impact on energy efficiency. Um, and I'm gonna crank it up and the, the, what's going on is that we're only able to change the energy efficiency of the new capital that's coming into the system. So it takes a long time for the old infrastructure, in this case, our car-based roads, urban design, uh, way of doing work to significantly change around the world. We add new stuff, we retire old stuff away, that old infrastructure lasts on, on average 15 years. So um, it's difficult to change the way that the whole society delivers transportation services, except slowly over time. So you have the gradual buildup of new infrastructure, the fading away of the old, and that takes a long time to diffuse through the system. Now, of course, there are short-term changes like more biking right now, but in most of the world, it's very difficult to radically change, except over the decades. So basically, it takes a good bit of time. Um, all right, so we're back here at 3.4. Is there a second question that uh, seemed like everyone should consider it, or should we just uh, keep going and looking at some more of the um, suggestions that popped up? I think I think we can keep going. People are just excited to see a lot of different solutions play out. Yeah, and um, well, at this point, I'm just going to take off a different hat. So I think. Partly what we're doing with this workshop is we really want to have this conversation about what could be in, we can invest in post COVID-19. But the second part I want to just name is that this is not the climate interactive show. We're not here to run this workshop. We're here to give you this tool and have you engage your colleagues in the kinds of conversations I'm trying to set up with you now. We'll show you more of the resources later. But the short version is, this is a tool for you. And actually, let's just do this right now. Um, uh, it's for you with your community. It's for you and your students. If you're a teacher, um, it's you and the world. For example, right now, you can go to uh, share your scenario. So you can go into Twitter, and I could just post this uh, out into the world. Well, actually, I'll just do it. So I just tweeted out into the world this 3.4 degree scenario. If you go onto Twitter, you can go find it right now. Um, I'm copying the scenario right now. And actually, well, I'm just gonna give it to you. Let's just do this early so that particularly the folks out there who appreciate this kind of information early on, um, what I'm gonna say, Drew sending scenario, I'm typing this in. So what I'm doing right now is I have just sent you a link 
to this exact scenario, this 3.4 degree scenario that kills coal, invest in energy efficiency and electrification. And you, if you want to multitask while you're in this webinar, open it up and then see what actually does it take to get down to well below two degrees. So then when you make your suggestions next about what it's gonna to take to get to two, it's gonna be informed by some analysis. And um, so use it for yourself, but mostly this is a way for you to prompt some conversations like we're having right now. So many of you here go play with the model right now, check it out, and I'm gonna open up questions. Um, Caroline, what's uh, another suggestion from another area of the model that you see in the questions box that um, we should try out? Because I'd love to see us get well below two degrees or 1.5, particularly for things that could particularly spark by post-COVID-19. What else do you see there? I'm not looking at the questions box myself. Yeah. Um, well, let me just see what a couple of people are saying. Yeah. What We've got, oh, sorry. We've got um, a couple of people talking about if there's, uh, money put towards uh, nuclear energy. Yeah, great. Well, I'm gonna, um, so people, and I saw a bunch of those early on. This is where we're gonna do, I'm going back to another version of the model, which is just start from the business as usual again. So here we are at business as usual. And um, what if we, and right now, this blue line is a business as usual case for nuclear. What if we had more investment? So. Imagine in your head that blue line's gonna go up. If I increase it to here, this is well beyond what the IAEA, the global body that thinks about energy futures on, on uh, uranium-based nuclear thinks is possible. So if we saw this kind of change, now look how different this is. Over on the right, I'm gonna increase it up. This is a subsidy of a half of uh, five cents per kilowatt hour, a huge subsidy. Look over on the bottom right, we had huge growth in nuclear demand. How does it help? Well, look at the brow line. We would have less coal in the long term. It's not a silver bullet. You can't plant a garden with one seed. It takes multiple seeds to plant in order to get there. So it could be something that would displace some gas and some coal and therefore get us a little lower in our emissions and therefore bring temperature down a little bit more. In this scenario here, I'm gonna increase it. If we had some more, it would keep some gas in the ground. Um, and here we go, it shaves off 0.1 degree. All right, what else are you seeing out there, Caroline? What if businesses were required to implement carbon capture technology? Carbon capture technology, fascinating. So there's a lot that can be done, possibly. These are technologies that don't exist. So far, we've been talking about thing, implementing things that do exist right now but um, they, at scale I'm talking, they don't exist yet at the kind of scale that I'm gonna implement them at. So we're gonna look at some of the potential and really just the offering for you, of course, is that when you look at this, we have looked at five different types of carbon removal, bioenergy carbon capture and storage, direct air capture, enhanced mineralization, ag soil carbon, and biochar. And we could imagine any of them, you probably should think about which one we actually have carbon uh, coal capture and storage and also gas CCS, it's called. So if we had um, a significant amount of it, and we're gonna look at what some of the assumptions are, or we're gonna, uh, we're gonna adopt some of the assumptions from a recent study by the Royal Society. I'm gonna increase it. Um, and actually, when we increase it, I wanna, um, we're gonna watch not the energy. And it's really great to get the proper uh, graph. So here's sources of net CO2 removal over time and the different types. If we increase it a good bit, first think, what is this temperature going to go to? Is this the one seed that could plant the whole garden? Think, think, think. 3.3 goes down where? Oh, and actually, this is even, there's even a better graph uh, to show. Okay, I'm going to slow down. Uh, this is a better graph to use. And, and note, this is our favorite list of graphs to look at. You just click right here and you can see, here are the best ones to look at. Greenhouse gas, this one shows all of the emissions stacked. So in 2020, you can see land use CO2 emissions in green. Added on top of it is in black, energy CO2. It's not going up and up and up and increasing. 
because you're keeping coal in the ground, because you have energy efficiency in transport, because you have a little nuclear, you have some electrification. F gas is in, in uh, yellowish there, methane on top and nitrous oxide. If we have removal, think where it's gonna show up. It's not an emission, it is a removal. So it's gonna be below zero. It is gonna be going down here below the zero line. So think if we had a significant amount, is it the one seed? So I'm gonna increase it a large, large amount, and then we're gonna try it several times. This is growing up to about seven gigatons net removals per year. Look first, look on the left, you can see the five types growing. It takes a while for them to grow. When you have those removals going in the positive direction, over on the right, see the gray area. That's the removals, pulling carbon out. That gets us, what did it do? 0.1 degree, 0.1 degree. It's not the one seed. It could be one of the many seeds that need to get planted in the garden in order to get where we want to go up towards the maximum if we did many more of them up to a huge, huge amount, 14 gigatons. Still notice that's a large amount, but it is still small relative to the emissions we're still putting in the atmosphere. So it's one of the seeds possibly, and uh, but it gets down to 3.1. So that's a possible contribution. Caroline, what else are you seeing as other suggestions of, of what helps? And now you guys have the model, so you actually, some of you maybe are, are looking at it and, and might know. So please go ahead. What other other things that could get us well below two degrees? Yeah, so this is an interest, interesting one in the context of our conversation. Uh, someone suggested, what does reducing deforestation do? As we know that habitat loss is Great. tied into the COVID-19 uh, source. Oh, yeah. Um, Boy, I hadn't made that connection, thank you. Habitat loss and the connection to the causes of COVID-19, I, I hadn't heard that. Um, thank you for making that connection. Um, we're chopping down a lot of our trees, we're losing biodiversity. Um, and one of the side effects of that, or one of the effects of that, is that uh, we're transforming forested land into agricultural land to serve hungry people around the world. This is happening in Brazil and Indonesia all over. And you see that green area? That is, those are those emissions. So I'm going to uh, pull up over here those removals and land use and look at um, where this net land use, net carbon removal. I'm gonna look at some of the other, uh, let's see, deforestation. Um, emissions. So here's net land use emissions. What we're going to do, and we can look at them here, here's, we're assuming that they're flat throughout the century. If that decreases over time, think about what it's going to do. Now, mind you, 100 years ago, this was the main source of carbon dioxide going in the atmosphere. But now we've got the growth of burning coal, oil, and gas. It's relatively small. So think about what it's gonna do. 3.1 goes down where? If it goes down all the way to zero, it would bring us from 3.1 to 3.0. It shrinks, but it's one of the seeds and it's much smaller than most people think just because those emissions are not that much relative to burning coal, oil, and gas. But it is one of the seeds that plants the garden. Okay, thank you, Caroline. Others, we're at three. How can we get so, lower? Yeah, so um, we've got people asking, what if when we rebuild this economy, governments uh, start or stop uh, infusing money into fossil fuel industries? What if we do it into fossil fuels? Thank you. And we've got that going already here with less coal, but really the most efficient way for governments to do that would be a carbon fee and dividend, some sort of carbon pricing plan. And, um, if you haven't looked at it yet, there's extensive uh, controls here for carbon pricing. I'm going to keep it pretty simple and just say, what if we had a very high carbon price around the world? Think about which two lines are going to move. Now, it's it's not going to affect coal. You've already banned coal infrastructure. But what other lines are going to move? Well, of course, natural gas and oil. So I crank that up. Wow. It makes a huge impact. You can see 3.0 goes down to 2.3. We see the black, excuse me, the blue line of natural gas shrink, oil shrinks. 
this is a significant price. It's actually, let me, I need to take a peek. It's very high. Uh, $183 a ton is what we just tested. Brings us down to 2.3 degrees. We see huge growth in wind and solar in green if we had this scenario. So here we are at 2.3 degrees. So I'll ask you, look at this scenario. And, you know, actually, I'll send it to you again. Uh, I'm just going to grab it. And if you want to start where we are right now, and I'm going to put this into the chat box. Here it comes. Um, so if you want to start with where we are right now as a scenario, here's the next puzzle. We're at 2.3. We want to get to well below 2 degrees. What are the main sources of emissions? What is really driving temperature up all the way to 2.3 as opposed to where we really want to go? So look over on the right here. And Caroline, do you see anyone? You know what the answer is, Caroline. What is the next thing probably that needs to be done in order to help here? And is anyone guessing it? And, and who wins the the challenge right now? We've got a, a couple of people who are chiming in. Yeah. <laughs> so I think people, and people have been asking this throughout uh, the session anyways, people are really curious about reducing methane, switching to a more vegetarian diet. Uh, how can yeah, this like, help? Yeah. Good thinking, and if you look at the model now, ask the question, where are the emissions coming from in this scenario? Um, see this big blue area of methane, and so food, agriculture, it's important as an important player. 30% of emissions are not carbon dioxide. Uh, those are many of the other seeds that need to get planted for the garden here. So look at this methane in other area, and when you use this, and I'm gonna note here for a second, you know, it's cool that we can calculate the impacts here, but the way that you will use this model is not to show answers. The way it is, it, I hope, is working with you right now. This is a method for engaging people in creating grounded hope. Grounded hope. You're trying to get them to think about the future, think about these investments in a grounded way. But when I say hope, I mean building a sense of possibility for the future. So when I test methane right now, I wanna give you the answer, but it's not, the purpose isn't just to give you the answer. The purpose is to get you and your colleagues, your students, your representatives, your friends, thinking about this system and thinking about what's gonna be needed. So at this moment is a chance to educate about these other gases. And so this is a time to for me to teach you, or you maybe you knew this already, that they come in two big areas, agriculture and waste emissions, that is methane, and this is not just cows, we think about cows a lot, but it's also wastewater, it's landfills, it's nitrous oxide in um, fertilizer, but also energy and in industry emissions. Methane, N2O, F gases from industry, uh, the Kigali Amendment, you know, uh, SF6, all these other gases which are up here that's what we're going to change we've already made a big big impact think about for a second why look over on the right we haven't moved this slider but it's already gone down why one of the hugest sources on methane is the oil and gas industry and you have a significant carbon price and you have energy efficiency and you have electrification so those red line of oil is going down the blue line of, of natural gas is going down so you have less leakage from that industry it's already being affected a lot. What if we did more in ag and waste emissions? 2.3 goes down if we were to adopt, this is vegetarian diets, it's a lot of other things. 2.0, we're almost well below two degrees. And then if we also have effects here, 1.9, all the way down well below, well, below two degrees. So give yourself a hand actually give yourself a hand and we got well well below two degrees so here is a scenario and i'll send it to everybody um uh, i'm going to grab it and just send it to everyone so that you can see it and maybe a challenge to you would be right now why not take this scenario and on your own see what it would take to get to to 1.5 or to the goal that you have or change the thing some people are going to come in here and say wait receive it and say, wait, I don't like nuclear power. Or I don't think we're gonna do electrification. What would be necessary? Actually, it seems like we can get there without those two things. Oh, two, and he, my point is, oh, we'll add buildings and, energy, uh, buildings and industry energy efficiency. So change the scenario, go up here to 
share your scenario, put it on Twitter. Actually, just yesterday, we've learned that now we figured out how to put it onto Facebook. So you could share right here, your scenario would get posted to Facebook and other people would see your vision of a world that addresses climate change with its investments post COVID-19. So take this scenario, change it, um, think about how you can uh, make it and optimize it for what you really wanna see. Um, I'm gonna pause for a second. Any questions that are coming up, Caroline, that you think really need to get addressed before we head into this last 15 minutes? I think we can uh, come back to these questions at the end of the session, if you'd like. Great, okay. So what are we seeing here? Some of the main lessons that are coming out, what is it gonna take in our actions and our investments post COVID-19? The first thing is there's no one seed to plant this garden. We like to think about this as we're looking for the one thing and it's very natural as if, well, like with COVID-19, as if like a vaccine, like what's the one thing that the world really needs to solve this problem, one thing. With climate change, there isn't one seed. Instead, it is multiple seeds in multiple sectors, from energy to our society, to all around the world that are required in order to, need, uh, to address this challenge. The other point is that it's possible, it's still possible to address this and to get on track to 1.8 degrees. And I'd like to just pause here for a second regarding this point of possibility. I'd like you to just consider the possibility that out of this crisis, we could take these lessons that you wrote in the question box earlier and apply them and make this happen. So what we're going to do is I'd like you to spend 60 seconds, and it's a long time, 60 seconds, but we're gonna be silent for 60 seconds. And I want you to think, what would you love about being part of a world that was on track to making this happen? What would you love to be part of a world that every day was doing all it could to make a scenario like this happen? Not what would you love in a policy sense, but what would you personally love? What would be meaningful to you? What would you love? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get my phone here, I'm gonna get my timer, and I'm going to turn this on for 60 seconds. Think for 60 seconds, consider this possibility, and then think, what would you love? And in a minute, we're gonna ask you to write a few words in the question box. So here we go, 60 seconds. What would you love? Okay, that's 60 seconds. Please write in your question box, what would you love about being part of such a world that was addressing these challenges? I'm uh, looking in here to the question box um, and maybe you can help me, Caroline. Let's read back and forth. What would you love? So write into your question box what you would love. Cleaner air, more forest to walk in, says Raymond. Staying alive, says Kurt Newton. Enjoy nature with grandchildren, says Colin. Change in values, more meaningful relationships with one another. Well-being of future generation. Caroline, you wanna read some? What are you seeing here? Yeah, uh, smaller communities sourcing their own material and energy needs, a green space. People in the, in the global south would feel less affected by deadly climate impacts. Fantastic. Choosing the simple style of life. Keep going, you're doing great. Yeah, climate justice around the world, a non-market-driven society, 
equitable growth. Oh, uh, Paul one. Perkins, you're going to break my heart. Would love to, to be able to tell my grandchildren the world was okay. Keep going, uh, happy, Caroline, what are you saying? Yeah, happy farmers, climate justice, a truly circular economy. This is beautiful, fantastic. So yeah. one, one note for what we're doing, I'm putting my other hat on everybody. What are we doing with this kind of tool? It's not just a calculator to say what the temperature is going to be. We're engaging your colleagues, your students, in a vision of a world that works. We know we need to imagine a world that's gonna work. Like an athlete imagining what their next action is going to be, we're going to need to envision a world that we see that we really want. So use this as a tool to envision those futures. Also wanna ask, that was really great, thank you. Another question, uh, we've been doing all this research, Cassandra, you're on the line and you've been leading much of this research with us on what we call multi-solving, protecting the climate while improving health. We know how important that is right now, equity and well-being. So a question is, there are so many benefits to our actions that we're taking right now that are not just about the future climate, and many of you just mentioned them. You just mentioned many of these things. Um, our co-director and co-founder, Dr. Beth Sawin, with the team, created this flower, the framework for long-term, whole system, equity-based reflection. The idea is to think about what are the things that get better if we take these actions in food and water, in jobs and assets, in health, well-being and safety, connection, energy, industry and mobility, resilience. You just mentioned many of these things just when I said, what would you love? So I'm gonna invite you now for another minute what write some more things, more co-benefits to the actions that we just imagined. And um, write that in. What are other co-benefits that you can imagine? And if you're looking for tips in the model, um, what you can do, our team created, so here we are taking action, and I'll just pull one up, methane and other. You hit the I button, and over on the right here, scroll down, potential co-benefits of decreasing methane and other gases. Plant-based diets are healthier for individuals. Reducing methane leakage can save money. Co-benefits. So write in your questions box right now, what are co-benefits that you know of? And Caroline, if you see any, start reading them, please. Yeah, we're just gonna give everyone a second. Oh, we've got better air quality. Just give everyone Great. a minute to get things in. Yeah, type other things. Cleaner air and water. Fewer people suffering from respiratory disease. Fantastic. Happier people. Social great. equity. Less conflict from resource grabbing. That's a great one. Absolutely. More localization. Stronger communities. Sustainable and many of the resources. We have other resources for you to think about this topic on the website for you to go down. If you scroll down here and you go to multi-solving, here are all of those topics, abundant resources here. Please read some more while I click around and show people what's possible. Yeah, so uh, we see less vector-borne diseases, a continuation of the human race and other biodiversity. Uh, more opportunities for people who currently are living with dirty water. Uh, Let's see, working from home means less traffic, less stress, and cleaner air. Global communities with a greater sense of trust. Less income inequality. Better food. Fewer extinctions. Fantastic. Reduced, reduced impacts from pole mining and generating plants near poor communities. Great. Fantastic. A great Thank one. You. World peace. So what what you're learning about is the full picture of what we're trying to do with the simulator and i want to present to you some of the resources that we have for you to run this workshop and also the game associated with it and maybe you've heard about this but if you go to this page and actually bindu you're on the call here's bindu up there on the top of it uh so workshops and games the workshop that we're just doing right now is the climate and roads climate workshop so all of it is here. There's an introductory video about how it works. There is a training plan that you can learn that you can use. There are videos of us so you can watch how to lead it. 
all the slides that we need to show, a facilitator guide, all of these materials, the one page guide that you just saw. Um, excuse me, that just got a lot bigger. I did not want that, pardon me. Um, so, pardon me. Maybe start a new tab or, or just yeah, zoom out with your... Got really weird. Okay, um, so here we are. So workshops and games. I just told you about the workshop. There's also for you to lead, and we just did this online, we'll do this in the future, a role-playing game where people play the roles of different stakeholders. All the information is here. It's been played in many places around the world, and there are pictures of it here at the bottom of a way for people online to play the roles of conventional energy companies, clean energy companies, land, food, and ag, uh, uh, the world governments, climate justice advocates, all of you to come together and engage with each other about how to solve this problem in a role-playing kind of exercise. The other thing that we developed, we've just put together, we were in the middle of a sprint for this, is an online version. So I'm gonna to go to the workshop page and here it, are resources for online engagement. So what we developed is an En-ROADS guided an assignment. So if, you have, if you're a professor or a teacher, what you can do is just give them this page. They watch a 20 minute video, it's right here, which is our introduction to the simulator, and then they download an assignment that shows them, okay, go read this and ask some questions. Make a scenario and ask difficult questions. How did it help the climate? How did it help the economy? How did it address equity? Who are the winners and losers? This is a PDF that you could give out to people. They can then uh, answer all these questions as a way to prompt this without you having to be a really excellently trained facilitator already. The other materials that we have here um, are really um, the, the possibility of taking this online course. So if you really wanna take this step, and I see many of you on this page, uh, I saw Kurt Newton, your name, and others have become En-ROADS Climate Ambassadors. So you are, you En-ROADS Climate Ambassadors, you know who you are out there, are the 105 people who have gone through the seven-part webinar to do exactly what I just did, which is to facilitate a conversation using En-ROADS on addressing climate, thinking about the investments needed, thinking about multi-solving and in really creating a sense of hope and possibility for people out there. Here are the people in Europe, here are the people in Latin America, I think Eduardo, you're on the call right now. In North America, there's Kurt. So these are many of the folks who are doing it. How do you become that? Well, you sign up here for this training program and it's free, it's online, it's all here. There are seven webinars that lead you through the basics of what you just saw, the workshop, the game, and then this part one and two. You heard me explaining how electrification helps, how a carbon price helps, et cetera. These are the two webinars where we teach you how, uh, how to explain what's going on in the model, how we build confidence. I didn't even talk to you much about confidence at building in the model. That's the one here at the bottom. How we compared our scenarios to the best available science, the integrated assessment models that are out there, the SSPs using some of the jargon of the large global integrated assessment models that have been created. Um, and of course, if you're scientifically minded and you wanna go there, this webinar and this presentation is the main one for you to look at. I'm seeing that there are just three minutes left. We really wanna end on time to get you on with the rest of your day. So I'm gonna ask, ask one, is there one other question that you're seeing, Caroline, that we should um, address before we close? Yeah, I think you could just speak quickly to um, how people who are interested in becoming an ambassador can do so, and I'll be sending the link to the training plan to complement your description. Yeah, in the chat. thank you, thank you. So to get involved, go to that website and look for the training plan and actually go to the chat box right now, which is being sent to you. Um, and sign up to become an ambassador. Um, all the videos are online, and also in the next few months, we're gonna be running the webinar series live. So tell us that you wanna be part of that and sign up for that webinar series, and we'll make sure that you get added to it. 
Um, what we're going to do is we're going to close really on the hour, just like we promised. But then we're going to stick around and try to answer verbally some of your questions, or maybe we haven't even gotten to them because we weren't fast enough with the typing. But overall, yeah. I'd like. Oh, I was just going to insert one yeah. thing before we sign off. Um, if we weren't able to answer your question in the chat box and you have to sign off now, please remember to send all of your inquiries to support at climateinteractive.org. You can just use that email um, and send any other questions that we might not have been able to catch if you have to sign off now. That email is right here, support and um Please write in Twitter or elsewhere what you think is interesting about this work. Share it with the world. Um, I'm gonna go back and show this scenario that we created again. And overall, here's where we are, is that we're in a global health crisis, economic crisis. And we know that coming out of it, we're going to want to orient our personal lives, our community lives, our business and governments and collective global society towards rebuilding our lives and our economies. And we have the chance to do it in a way that's going to address one of the main root causes and uh, kind of risk amplifiers of global crises like this. How do we prevent the next global existential threat? How do we help do that in ways that also help promote justice and equity in the near term. Do it in ways that help the vulnerable people whom we're trying to protect. We are offering a method, not an answer, but a way to engage people. And we hope that you can take these tools to think with your friends and colleagues, with your leaders and communities about some really important questions about what is it going to take the fact that there is no single seed that's gonna plant this garden, the fact that it's gonna take multiple and that some of them are higher leverage and some of them are lower leverage, frankly, as you're seeing. Many are needed, but some are really needed. The ones that are most needed will be keeping coal, oil, and gas safely in the ground. Also, engage them with the fact that it's still possible. And as you just wrote, we would love it if we were on track and it means a lot to us so we're going to do all we can to make this kind of scenario happen overall my friends it's not going to be easy it's going to be worth it go get them we believe in you all right we're going to close this please get on with the rest of your day if you happen to want to stick around um, after a short pause we will be here and we're going to uh, answer some more questions Thank you very much. We're pausing and I think we'll come back if people want to stick around and we're going to answer our questions and talk a little bit um, together. Okay, um, Caroline, I assume you can still hear me. This is good. We're getting attendees getting on with their day and the number is shrinking down. Um, I am sticking around uh, to answer other questions. Were there others, Caroline, that you're hearing that, that should be addressed now? Can a teenager become an ambassador? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, are you looking yeah. at a country set of options? No, Anupam. Hi, Anupam. Uh, we'd like to, we don't have the modeling capacity to do it right now, but um, there are some excellent country level system dynamics models that are out there. Um, is anybody there, working on, can, okay, go ahead. Um, there are two things that we didn't get to do in our demonstration that a lot of people were asking for as well, if you wanna, bring inroads back up, people might enjoy seeing uh, 
uh, people were really wondering about what happens when we reduce the rate of population growth and then also um, decreasing the global economy growth. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm going to open the model. So there's two answers. Uh, there's, you could, so what I'm hearing is economic growth and population growth. You can imagine yeah. in the context of this scenario that we've already created, but also, and I think I might just start with it uh, here, and that is without anything else. And the short answer is, um, let's try it. So here we were with our business as usual scenario. So think if we had slower population growth and we have the range of UN scenarios, we moved it closer to the low end with population, we just need less energy. If it peaked here around 9.4 billion instead of heading up to 11, and if it fell, um, it's one seed. It's not all the seeds. It's one seed that needs to get planted. If we had empowerment of women and girls, if we had lower fertility rates, then it would lead to less energy use and therefore less emissions because it would lead gross world product to grow more slowly, and therefore it might help. And like I showed at the very start, lower economic growth in the same way. Neither of these things on their own, at this time in reasonable rates, uh, solve the problem, but help, 3.6 degrees. So these are things that you can test and look at. Um, great question. Other questions that you're seeing coming up? Yeah, so I know we talked briefly about where people can find the training plan online. Can you just give everyone a, a quick version of what it takes and who can become an yeah. Enroads Climate Ambassador? There's a lot of interest. Great, great question. So uh, the way you become an Enroads Climate Ambassador first is you uh, get in touch with us and let us know that you want to become one. So right here, contact us. Go to the contact us on our webpage and say, please sign me up to become an ambassador and you will get information about it. But you could go do it right away by going to our En-ROADS Climate Workshop and uh, going down to explore our resources for online, uh, complete, complete the training plan right there. The En-ROADS uh, en Training Plan. And these are all the steps that are right here. Join the webinars. So you will take seven hour, hour and a half long webinars. And they're like this one you just saw, but on different topics. Those are all here. I just showed you many of them. You read the En-ROADS user guide. The, you'll explore the simulator, the materials, the facilitator guide that we created. And then you'll watch others in action. You just did it, but here are other people leading. Um, the event, practice and get feedback. You're gonna run it with two groups online. You'll get set up a Zoom meeting or do it on Skype uh, or your family. You'll take a practice test, that's right here, and you'll submit an application. Those are all the steps and that's what all those 100 people have done. Anything you would add, Caroline, because you're one of the people who helped design this thing. Yeah, um, I just wanted to add a few quick things. Um, it's entirely free. Anyone who is interested in completing the training plan is welcome to apply. Uh, there's no charge. Uh, anyone can do it. You can be a, a motivated high schooler. You can be uh, from any background as long as you're willing to go through the steps needed. And uh, there is no deadline, so it's it's really rolling. We have the recordings of the webinars available at any time, so you can complete it at your own pace. Um, we just want people who are really motivated to use model to apply, so we encourage you to complete the training plan uh, before applying. Great. I'm seeing my old friend Anupam ask, are there any bridges you build between the model and the actions of ordinary people? Um, you'll see that some of the actions Anupam that are here, you could think of as the collective action of many people together, such as in transportation energy efficiency that we showed before or consumption or diets or rooftop solar and wind and other things that can be done 
So some of them, but mostly this model is about collective action around the world. This, what is the effect of single-use plastic industry? Good question. Um, I don't really know, but it is not a huge effect on the climate. It may be one of the seeds that plants the garden, but it is not a large one um, in my understanding of the math of it. Um, other, let me look and look and see what other questions. What is the deadline for applying to be an ambassador? Oh, you wrote that. There's no deadline. Just do it anytime. Um, other questions that we have. Otherwise, we're going to sign off. And um, if you loved this, we're running another one, 2 p.m. today, Eastern. That is in six hours. There's another one. And then another one, um, eight hours after that at 10 p.m. Eastern. And then in a week, we're going to be running a training webinar on all of these materials. So uh, please join us. Send your colleagues, send your friends. How would you do that? Well, you go to webinars here and uh, the Get Involved right here on webinars. You can see um, all the webinars that we have. So what you're seeing right here, have them sign up for this right now or um, other sessions that are possible. Anything and else you would add before? Yeah, Caroline. I was just going to say the link to next week's webinar is also in the chat too, if you would like to just click on that. Great. Great. Um, all right, everybody. You know, Caroline, maybe you could give the last information and then if you would close us out. Of course. Thanks, Drew. Uh, so I'm going to be dropping uh, a couple of links in the chat box. Feel free to go there, but the easiest way to access all of these resources is just to visit us at climateinteractive.org. From there, you'll be able to navigate to many of the pages Drew showed us uh, while he walked through our website. So I just wanna thank you all. There is so much great participation, um, a bunch of fantastic questions, ideas. We love seeing that. And we're so excited that many of you are interested in becoming an ambassador please follow through. We really rely on motivated people like you from all over the world to help us lead engaging events and make a difference on climate. So thank you all for joining us um, and we will be signing off here. Thank you. <laughs>